and welcome everyone to a fantastic Tuesday on the Damage Report. I am not your host, Francesca Fiorentini. John Idarola, of course, is working on a novel or going to Ikea a lot or something. We don't know, but I'm so happy to have you all here. Good to be here on this very important Tuesday. We got some great stories to get to, so everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, make sure you're subscribing and sharing and all the good stuff. And with me, I'm so, 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 so excited to finally do a show with this man. He is the host of TYT's newest show. That's right, like a five day a week, like a, like a show show, I believe. The host of Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. Please welcome Dr. Rashad Ritchie. My dear sister, good to be with you and <laughs> the feeling is mutual. I'm glad to do a show with you. Oh My gosh, it's been so long and I was just saying yeah. your show is really does have a lot of debating with Republicans, which to be honest, like I don't think I have the stomach for or like the ability to restrain myself. But it's a good thing it's like we're all virtual now. Yeah, I don't have the stomach for it either. So I keep Pepto-Bismol like right to my left, <laughs> uh, during breaks I drink it like water. Uh, and that's how I get through those ridiculous debates sometimes. Yeah, you need like a whiteboard to understand what kind of argument they're making. Yeah, and you realize it doesn't hold. They any don't water. know the argument, right? Yeah, they they're not even clear. Um, well, it's so good to have you here. Um, and for everybody, I wanted to just make a few announcements before we jump into this. Of course, once again, make sure you're hitting that like button. But also, uh, TYT's got this new thing called Twitch Pitch, which is basically you being able to. Stream, basically, are you gonna be TYT's next stream star? If you think you can be, if you think you got what it takes, suddenly it's like a the voice or something, you know, America's next top, TYT's next top streamer. Go to tyt.com slash twitch pitch to find out more. You can submit two minute audition tapes, videos, talk about your interests, like what do you like to yammer about? People wanna know, that's what that's what Twitch is for, also video games. So you can also submit videos by tweeting at the Young Turks using the hashtag twitch pitch. So everybody, and of course, if you haven't seen Dr. Rashad's Richie Indisputable on Mondays, well, don't worry, because you can catch it every day now. So super excited, but uh, Dr. Shot, are you ready to get into this? Let's get into it, I'm ready. All right, so today is the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, who was killed by a former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, who was surprisingly convicted of murder, of murder, making him a murderer. Um, Derek Chauvin, of course, kneeled on the neck of George Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds as onlookers watched in, in horror. Um, and as terrifying as that moment has been, and, and as much as we've all, we've all been shocked by it, um, this it, all, it has only grown a movement. It has only sparked a giant massive movement that is building on the backs of the Black Lives Matter movement that had been ongoing, um, and so that is, Perhaps one of the most, the biggest silver linings of this entire story. Um, but of course, Floyd's family has been in Minneapolis commemorating um, his his murder today, and also they're in D.C. visiting President Joe Biden, who uh, did welcome them into the White House. Um, but I wanted to go to this quote from George Floyd's sister, Bridget Floyd, who says, "It's been a long year. It's been a painful year." Uh, Bridget Floyd told the crowd, it's been very frustrating for me and my family and for our lives to change in the blink of an eye and I still don't know why. And then I also wanted to go to a little clip of uh, George Floyd's girlfriend and uh, Jelani Hussein of the Council on American Islamic Relations who were speaking outside of St. Paul at a rally commemorating his murder um, on Sunday. Floyd was my man, he was but one man and there are so many cases that we need to reopen, not only in this state, in this country, across the world. We all know that. What I remind every single one of you is Minnesotans, we have failed George Floyd. We have failed George Floyd's family. We have failed the countless families who are standing here because nothing has been done in this state. 
Right, so that was Jelani Hussein on the Council on American Islamic Relations with George Floyd's family outside of St. Paul. Um, just wanted to go to to a quote from Reverend Al Sharpton, who was there along with uh, the family's attorney, Benjamin Crump, saying, we want something coming out of Washington. We want something that will change federal law. There's been an adjournment on justice for too long. George Floyd should not go down in history as someone with a knee on his neck, but as someone who broke the chain of police brutality and illegality. So here you have the family continuing to call for real reform, and yet so much truly has changed. It feels like we're living in a different, um, at least political atmosphere when it comes to the issue of police brutality uh, and and a racist institution. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts, Dr. Rashad Ritchie, on on this and the one year anniversary. Yeah, let me first say uh, we're thankful uh, for so many who continue to fight uh, the George Floyd family. Um, hearts and prayers are with them. But let's be very clear about what happened. George Floyd was an unwilling, involuntary, sacrificial lamb. And this country is about to allow that lamb uh, to be a rebel without a cause. Uh, because we have uh, been unable to pass the uh, George Floyd Policing and Accountability Act. That is justice, that's what justice looks like. And here's the other thing, we, we talk about the murderer that got convicted, Chauvin. But you have four monsters that killed. George Floyd, not one. And we still need convictions for the other cops who were there, who aided and abetted in that particular crime. And that's something that we are unsure in the black community if that will ever happen, if police officers will be held to that level of accountability. None of this is complex. America is saying the, the sentiment of this country, I'm talking about the majority, they're saying we want police reform. 94% of Americans are for it. 58% of Americans say that it needs to be dramatic. Hell, even 51% of Republicans say that police reform has to happen. So the question is, how in the world in a reality, political reality, social reality, policing reality, how is it that police officers are still immune to actual reform? And you have to look at police unions to get your answer. Mm -hmm. Police unions have become more powerful than the sentiment of the majority of American citizens. Absolutely, um, I, I we we played a clip yesterday of Tucker Carlson very upset that the Capitol Police um, were, in his words, using their political muscle to like you know strong arm Republicans. And you're like, wait a minute, you're okay with this happening in literally every city and state across this country? Police unions strong arm policy. All of the time, and yet when it comes to this one police force, because it doesn't fit within your narrative, yeah. of course you're against it. Um, because absolutely, the unions have an incredible, incredible amount of outsized uh, force on this. But I also wanted to just say that, like, I do think that you know the Black Lives Matter movement, beginning with the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, and the movement that 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 created, and also, ironically, let's not forget. How much police brutality has been done on demonstrators and on peaceful protesters? So, in a way, since 2014 to 2021, it's like, you know, cops keep on proving and proving and proving why they have way too much leeway, why they have way too much impunity, why they are violent, why they cannot be trusted to police the streets, especially when it comes to something that no right winger likes to talk about, which is our First Amendment rights and the right to peacefully assemble. Um, and so it does feel like last year and this whole year ensuing, whether or not the politicians are able to get it done on a grassroots, on a cultural level almost. This is a new generation of people who are not going to stand for another George Floyd, right? Like, and mind you, I mean, we we have I know on the show talked about Ronald Green and some of these, you know, in St. Louis and the and obviously Breonna Taylor and and still not getting justice for her family, but it does feel like there's a sea change. I don't. I, what are your thoughts on that? It's moving in the right direction, but it's still moving way too slow for my like. Okay, if we go back to the origin of policing, let's look at one of the first police agencies in America. It was the slave patrol and the slave patrol, they took an oath, they were paid, they had a badge, they had a gun. And their job was to literally police black people or runaway slaves and to protect the property and the property assets of whites. When you look at the current rendition 
of policing in America. It is not that far off from the original design to police black and brown people and to protect the assets of the affluent or white. That is the cultural dynamic. You can keep training folks all day. You can start creating new policy, which is a good thing and it moves in the right direction. But culture will eat policy alive any day. If you don't change the culture, it doesn't matter what policies you pass, they will figure out ways to overcome the policy in their corrupt, dark rooms in law enforcement. And that's why you have to see a total revamping or reimagining of police to make this work. Ithaca, New York is already doing it. You got Ithaca, New York, they did a study and they realized that 51% of their 911 calls didn't even need a cop. They needed a social worker. So what did Ithaca, New York do? They decided to create a system so that every two cops that are dismissed or resign or transfer, one must be replaced with a social worker until they get their numbers up congruent to the societal needs of that local community. Wow. That is reimagining policing. I love it, I love that. And I mean, yeah, and to your point, look, the reason I think that so many are outraged is because we've seen body cam footage and we've seen cell phone footage, but body cams are a perfect example. This was a reform. This was supposed to prevent police from acting with impunity because they were being filmed by themselves. And look at look at Ronald Green, look at what happened to him. Look at the way they brutalized him on camera. And yeah. then tried to cover up. It doesn't matter if there's a camera there. Yes, there's evidence. That's great, but that it's not saving lives. Yeah, from day one, I said if if we do this police camera thing, which I was part of that uh, lobbying effort years ago when we started the conversation, right? Mm. I said if you don't make it a felony, if a cop interferes with that footage or decides not to turn that footage over, you're going to have problems in the implementation of this new thing we call a body camera on a cop, right? You just had a situation where we know now in Louisiana, one of the cops who was under investigation just told the internal investigators, "Oh, I didn't have a body camera on that day. And they just trusted his word for it. Two years later, when the video footage is leaked of Mr. Green being killed by these cops, it comes out that he in fact did have a body camera. His body camera was on and active. He lied to the internal investigators and they allowed him to get away with it. Why has he not been charged with a felony obstruction, a felony tampering with evidence, a violation of oath of office, filing a false police report? Why has he not been charged with those crimes? I haven't even gotten to the murder yet. I'm talking about the things that we see on video contrary to what he wrote in that report. Right. I mean, and it's sad that like it has to be sometimes this technicality that will, you know, actually get some kind of justice when it really should be a human rights issue of That's murdering right. an innocent man. So let's move to that police reform right now. Um, what Dr. Rashad Ritchie was talking about in terms of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Um, so what progress has been made on police reform one year on since the murder of George Floyd? There is a bill that was passed in the House, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. But lawmakers have missed a key deadline, which is today, the anniversary of George Floyd's death, to pass it and to sign it into law, which supposedly President Joe Biden is willing and ready to do. So. From the lawmakers, it's sort of a bipartisan group. It is a bipartisan group. Um, they put out a statement saying the anniversary serves as a painful reminder of why we must make meaningful change. While we're still working through our differences on key issues, we continue to make progress toward a compromise and remain optimistic about the prospects of achieving that goal. So that was from Cory Booker, um, Tim Scott, who is a Senate Republican, Karen Bass, a um, House Democrat. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity 
the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Uh, so what is, what's the holdup? Why, why haven't we done anything on the federal level? So according to several lawmakers and aides familiar with the state of the talks, progress has been slow on the most sensitive matter, whether to loosen or eliminate the doctrine of qualified immunity that shields police officers and departments from civil liability in cases of misconduct. Of course, members of both parties said this week that they expect other matters under discussion, including banning of chokeholds, the creation of a national database of suspect officers, and the imposition of new training standards to quickly fall into place if there's an accord on qualified immunity. So Dr. Rashad Ritchie, what is the importance of qualified immunity? And do you think Democrats are, are right in holding out on this issue? I think they should hold out on the issue. And I know people that I respect a lot, like Congressman Clyburn. He has said maybe we need to get rid of qualified immunity to get this bill to pass. I disagree with him. I disagree with all institutional Democrats who believe that we are going to make true progress by compromising on an issue like that. Let's go to the origin of qualified immunity, because you're really fighting for the soul of this nation over things like qualified immunity. The origin of qualified immunity comes from racism. State lawmakers passed the rule of qualified immunity for cops in order to give cops who were racist and bigoted and busting in the head of children who were activists in the late 50s and 60s. They wanted to give these cops personal immunity so that if the federal government had a, if you had a claim, if the state had a claim, then you as a cop would be protected personally. Your assets are protected, your house is protected. Your family is protected. So you can go out and be as racist as you choose to be. As long as your department backs you, you have no personal liability. There is no other profession that enjoys this distinction outside of being a civil servant or cop working in government. Surgeons don't have this, psychiatrists don't have this. Why? We say the reason why police officers have this amazing ability called qualified immunity is because their job is so dangerous. It's not even one of the top 10 dangerous jobs in the United States. No disrespect to those who are in policing. I'm stating a fact. Mm -hmm. The fact is the most dangerous job in the United States based on violence and death is cutting trees. (laughs) Cutting trees, more people die per year per capita from cutting trees than in policing. You know what else is more dangerous than being a police officer? Based on the number of deaths associated with the industry, driving a taxi. Working at a convenience store. All of these jobs are much more dangerous based on the number of deaths per capita to the profession than being a police officer. But no one has ever made the argument because these professions are dangerous. If one of them operates in negligence or makes a mistake, that they should somehow be immune to tort law or be immune to civil penalty. You can't touch them personally. It makes no sense. It didn't make sense when they first started the law. It doesn't make sense today. Yeah, it's almost like it was designed for them to simply behave with impunity and do whatever they want. That's exactly what it was, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and to me, like looking at the other pieces of this legislation, right? So it's things like banning chokeholds. Well, New York State also had a chokehold ban and uh, Eric Garner was still choked and died. Um, you know, there were, there have been bans. And once again, like another one of the pieces is a discussion on raising the bar for uh, no knock warrants. It's not a abolishing no knock warrants, right? Yeah. Which I think it should be after the Breonna Taylor case, but it's not. It's, it's all the rest of it is mealy mouthed. The real, I think the crux of it is qualified immunity, um, which apparently Tim Scott is saying. 
This is Republican Senator Tim Scott. Like, well, if you have qualified immunity, police officers won't answer calls anymore in distress because they will be afraid. Dr. Rashad, what's your answer to that? Argument. Yeah, great. Uh, those are the cops you don't need on the streets. We need to know which ones are too afraid to do their jobs with competence because of their training, their insight, expertise, and relationships in the local community. If they are afraid to answer a call because they have the same level of accountability as every other professional in America, we need to know who they are, get rid of them, recruit new blood in, and this new blood knows exactly what they're getting into, right? There are two primary reasons for criminal law in the first place. And if we miss this, we've missed the whole element of why criminal law exists. Mm. Number one, to punish wrongdoers. Number two, to deter behavior. Those are your two primary reasons you have a criminal law statute or criminal law statutes. If you're telling me that you have created this whole statutory column just for police officers so that they cannot be punished under the law, under civil or criminal law. If you're telling me they can't be punished or there's a different standard for their punishment, what you are also doing is shaping their behavior. Because these laws were meant to punish wrongdoers and deter bad behavior. If you don't do this for them, then you are shaping their behavior or they are shaping their behavior and they're defining it as they choose. Absolutely, and and I mean, honestly, at this point, I'm like, Maybe police officers, not maybe, police officers should be afraid to use lethal force. Like, I think that should be a pretty big consideration before you take someone's life. And maybe the problem we have now is that they know that no matter what, they will be immune because of qualified immunity. One other question for you, Dr. Rashad, and I apologize, it's more like an interview, but I am just. Oh, it's you know, all good. You know, yeah. Well, one of your, you know, one of the pieces of this is whether or not qualified immunity could be reformed. This is what they're talking about to so that you could you that the department could be on the hook. I believe it's the department or the precinct could be on the hook versus the individual. Like is that a better is that a better um, almost uh, yeah, like a compromise? Um, Let me tell you why I think that's a bad compromise because if an officer, acts in a particular way while executing his or her duties, then the office to some degree may already be on the line. It mm -hmm. depends on how that jurisdiction interprets it. What I'm afraid will happen if we go with this federal compromise, that it basically doesn't change much locally. Because a lot of local jurisdictions, they have policies to make citizens whole when a cop steps out of line. It should be both. And here's why it should be both. There's a greater principle argument here. You know why surgeons don't make as many mistakes as they used to? It's because of tort law. Tort law would sue them to oblivion mm -hmm. if they made certain mistakes. And so the right. industry created practices, best practices and new certifications for surgeons. So that surgeons had to be board certified in order to limit their liability in the industry. And who benefits from that? The people who are getting the surgery. Mm -hmm. So who would benefit from police officers being held to a higher standard or what we call a normative standard of accountability? The people they police. And that's why I am no compromise on the immunity, the qualified immunity part of the bill. What do you think about, I mean, and this is interesting because I just wanna read this quote from the White House through Jen Psaki, who is saying the president is still very hopeful that he will sign the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act into law. She says, we're closely engaged with negotiators while also leaving the Senate room to work. You feel like this is enough? Like what, what else can Joe Biden do other than everything? Other than get the Democrats on board and abolish the filibuster. But yeah, what kind of pressure, what kind of pressure could we be seeing from the office of the White House around this issue? I've been trying to figure out Joe Biden as far as his leadership around these massive issues for a couple of months. Yeah. Either he is A, unable to lead in a particular way or he's unwilling to lead in a particular way. He has not placed the full weight of the White House behind anything, nothing. He has not placed the full weight of the mm -hmm. Democratic Party even against other Democrats. 
And these Democrats are holding up true progress in America. Exactly. The vast majority of America has voted for an agenda. They didn't vote for Joe. Let's be honest, nobody was excited about voting for Joe Biden. Hell, I wasn't excited about voting for Joe Biden. I was excited about voting for an agenda that was contrary to the monster we had in office for four years. And I did not want to see what that looked like eight years down the road, right? So we voted in a way that said we are putting an agenda above everything else. If Biden does not deliver the agenda by putting his full political weight behind these massive social policies to change the soul of this nation. If he doesn't do that, then we'll see him at the ballot box or not. Mm -hmm. That's how this will work. And, mm -hmm. and it's sad because you got great progressive leadership in power right now all across this country like never before. But he's still the guy, he's still the leader. You have to follow this guy to, to some degree and he's the one that can block anything. And if he's not leading in front, but trying to lead from behind in this era, it won't work. Yeah, I mean, and especially thinking about who gave him that mandate, right? Which right. communities, right? We're talking right. about the black community. We're talking about the immigrant community, which and are on those two particular topics. When it comes to police reform and when it comes to immigration reform, Biden is absolutely leading from behind. It is not, it is has not been his approach. He is not looking to stick his neck out for either of those two issues. And look, I think it's great that he invited the George Floyd family into, you know, the White House. That's that's fine. But what about going to Minneapolis? You know, what about going to the family? What about going to communities and really just talking with them? Seeing what about talking to the family of Dante Wright? You know, what about um, just looking and understanding for with his own eyes? I mean, imagine the press that that would cause. You know, right. that would be a huge statement. So I do think that there are other ways besides sort of symbolic meet and greet. Um, that you know, there's better symbolism to be had, <laughs> but mm -hmm. there's also yeah, like actually pushing for a piece of legislation. Or look, I don't know what can and can't you do with executive order. We still don't know, Rashad. We were like, I, I how know. many it, years? It's so, it's so ambiguous. And, and here's why I'm at. And a lot of people are going to completely disagree with me, and I'm fine. Okay, I'm fine with the disagreement. I'm at this place now. Damn it, do everything by executive order until a judge overturns it. And that, that's almost how the previous administration got stuff done. Just yeah. do it, do it. If a judge tells you you can't do a file an appeal, then file another appeal, but do something, do right. something, Joe. These folks depended on you to deliver an agenda. And why haven't you gone to uh, uh, Joe Manchin? I'm mm -hmm. talking about to his state, mm -hmm. bring a family to his state. Make an optical spectacle there. If you want to do optics, let's do it in the state of a guy who's low hanging fruit on one hand, but also an individual who's a contrarian to the progress we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to go to just one more aspect of this, this idea of qualified immunity and why it is so important, even though it sounds wonky. And who might not be on the side of holding police officers to account? So the US Supreme Court seems to have little interest in making it easier to get justice for police murder by recently declining to take up a case on whether to make it easier to hold municipalities liable for civil rights violations in connection to police who've committed murder or who have killed people, civilians. They rejected an appeal by the mother of a man killed by police in Ohio. So the justices turned away the appeal filed by a mother of a 23 year old man named Luke Stewart of a lower court ruling that threw out her claims made under federal law in a civil rights lawsuit against the city of Euclid and an officer involved in the 2017 incident. So more on that incident, the officer Matthew Rhodes, who shot Stewart in the chest and neck at close range, avoided liability for those claims through a legal defense called qualified immunity. Even though the lower courts determined that a jury might find that he unlawfully used excessive force. Um, the lawsuit filed by Mary Stewart accused Rhodes and other officers of using excessive force in violation of the US Constitution's Fourth Amendment ban on unreasonable searches and seizures. The suit also accused the Euclid police of a pattern of unconstitutional practices, particularly against black people. Her son was black, the officers are white. Um, and there's more on, you know, Stewart was sleeping in his car. I just, I let's just read it. Let me let me just give you the context of that. So Stewart had been sleeping in his car. When police came upon him, 
Rhodes entered the vehicle as Stewart tried to drive away. Rhodes punched Stewart, shocked and then struck him with a taser and finally shot Stewart in the check and the chest and neck with a gun. So not like we haven't heard that heinous story and murder before, but here you have the Supreme Court, right? Who it's on them to decide what they want to take up and what they don't want to take up. Dr. Rashad Ridgie, what does it mean that they decided not to take this case up? It means they scared, that's what it means, number one. I read this federal suit, this was a well put together federal lawsuit. And they hit all of the elements at, that they were supposed to hit. And they sought administrative remedy from the lower court as they are supposed to in mm. cases like this. It passed all of the tests. And then it gets to this highly selective group of individuals, conservative leaning obviously. And they decide not to take the case. Now think about this. If they knew, I'm talking about the conservatives on the court, if they knew that they could constitutionally back what the lower court did, they would take the case to create precedent. They mm -hmm. would take the case to create case law and there's no more supreme case law than those cats, right? But they did not take the case. They don't want the headache and their job is literally to unravel complex matters like this. I think this makes the argument for uh, enhancing the US Supreme Court uh, mm -hmm. as Democrats started to make that argument. Uh, somehow that argument has now kind of fallen to the wayside. But you must increase the number of Supreme Court justices in this country. You're yep. going to have to do it or they will unravel or not lay to rest major legislation that hopefully will get passed by a more progressive administration. Absolutely, I just to back up some of what you were saying around qualified immunity. Recent investigations have shown how under the guidance of the Supreme Court, lower federal courts are increasingly granting qualified immunity to police accused of excessive force, even when they have determined the officers acted illegally. So again, it's this Insane. on the highest court level. Yeah, no, 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 what you did was illegal, violated constitutional rights, civil rights, etc. murder, obviously. Um, and but no, but still qualified immunity because police are above the law. I mean, look, we're also in this moment where what has the Supreme Court decided to take up? Oh, Another abortion case, right. wonderful. Just the pro-life, pro-death party of a now, yes, inc like, it's not even fair to say right wing, it's not even fair to say conservative, but an extremist Christian nationalist bent of the Supreme Court. Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, they are not your run of the mill conservatives. But you see on MSNBC and you're like, why do they have a job? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would they're even, extremists. Yeah, they are extremists. And I would even argue that they are using their religion to disguise their darkness. Uh, I'm a Christian man, right? I believe in a radical messiah of color. I had someone call my show today, a white female. She belongs to the Tea Party. Um, she calls my show uh, semi often. So I have dubbed her Tea Party Lou. Her name is Lou. She's a Tea Partier. I call her Tea Party Lou. And so she always has the white supremacist point of view. Mm -hmm. And so today I just decided to ask her a simple question because if they can't answer this question, it actually answers a lot of questions about them. Yeah. Are you a Christian? I asked her. She said, yes, I'm a Christian. I said, what color is Jesus? She couldn't answer that. She started saying things like, why does it matter? Um, we're not talking about Jesus. Because her Jesus is white, he's fictional. The white Jesus is fictional. It, it, even if you don't believe in religion, even if you're not a Christian, historically, you're inaccurate. But if you're willing to believe that lie, you're also willing to believe the big lie that Donald Trump actually won the election and some mythical creature stole it from him. And this is the mentality you're dealing with. And that mentality now exists in the highest court of the land. It existed in inside of our White House. Trump was never a believer, he was just playing everybody. But he had people that were zealot in that way and they kept him in power. And they're hoping that he comes back. Yeah. Yeah, that mythical creature is just a white Jesus. <laughs> right, that's the mythical creature, absolutely. I, I love that she stalled because I feel like that's progress. I'm not trying to say like she's probably also not fairly backwards in her thinking, but the fact that she was like, but oh, why does it matter? Like that means <laughs> right. that she secretly knows that he was like North that's African, right. Arab, like, <laughs> like. Right, right, she didn't come out and just say, oh, he's white, right? 
I mean, yeah. now she knows better, right? <laughs> she didn't pull the Megan Kelly, like, you know, Santa is white, everybody. You should have followed up with a Santa line, and she could have been you like, know oh, what? That's what he's white. I used to play that clip on my radio show every Christmas. It was so <laughs> iconic to have Megan Kelly. And at that point, she was coming on like 9, 10 o'clock on Fox News. And so she says, okay, um, yep, Santa is white kids, just for the kids. Who in the hell is watching your show that's a child? <laughs> First of all, they believes in Santa Claus. Who is watching your program? But and then she she wanted to make sure she let people know that Jesus is white too. Here's what's scary: this woman got a whole damn law degree, which means she went to somebody's college for four years, somebody else's college for three years, maybe four years. She has almost seven or eight years of college. Wow! And this is what she says on her show. She was suspended for one day. They never said it was a suspension, but she she didn't come back the next day. Uh, and then she kind of gave uh, a halfway apology about telling telling her uh, children that watch her show at 10 p.m. at night uh, that somehow Jesus and Santa Claus are white. <laughs> and then she got a show on NBC, uh, but I'm not bitter, it's fine. Let's move on to another uh, region of the world that is also facing a, a good amount of police violence and militarization, uh, Israel, Palestine. So not everyone is in agreement that Joe Biden has done a bang up job when it comes to uh, settling the conflict in Israel, Palestine for the time being. Uh, even though he wants credit, a group of more than 500 Biden staffer or campaign and Democratic Party staffers are calling on the White House to do more to support Palestinian rights and hold the Israeli government accountable for what they say are human rights violations following the 11 days of conflict in Israel and Palestine. Um, addressed to the President, the letter explains, quote, the very same values that motivated us to work countless hours to elect you demand that we speak out in the aftermath of the recent explosive violence in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, which is inextricably inextricable from the ongoing history of occupation, blockade, and settlement expansion. Well, okay. I want to read a little bit more. Um, the letter continues and says, we commend your efforts to broker a ceasefire. Yet we can also we also cannot unsee the horrific violence that unfolded in the weeks in Israel, Palestine. And we implore you to continue using your power of your office to hold Israel accountable for its actions and lay the groundwork for justice and lasting peace. The signatures on the letter to Biden included 10 members of his 2020 campaign's national headquarters staff, eight members of the Democratic National Committee staff during the race. And but most of the signers work at in states where Biden won the presidency and worked for the Biden campaign. Um, Dr. Ritchie, what do you what do you make of this pretty bold move from these 500 former campaign staffers? I used to be a campaign staffer years ago. I'm proud of them, proud of them uh, because they publicly affixed <laughs> their name on something they believed in that challenged the establishment that's contrary to their values. Mm -hmm. The earlier you learn how to do that, the better you will be able to lead. I am proud of all 500 of these staffers. Mm. Let me talk about Joe Biden. Joe Biden has a soul. Let, let's be clear, Joe Biden is not Donald Trump. Joe, Donald Trump has no soul, he's a horrible person, we all know that. Biden has a soul, but Biden is also steeped in traditionalism, institutional politics, He's friends with people that are contrary to policy that would help our communities. Mm -hmm. This is Joe Biden. This is the kind of political creature he is. Yes. But he has moments. He has moments where we have seen him change his mind about things. And I don't care if he if he's changing his mind because it comes from his heart. But we have seen him change his mind. I'm hoping this gets to him. And we we know a lot of Democrats are lobbying him. Uh, we have progressives that have already spoke out against him publicly. Uh, Joe Biden has been an utter failure in this uh, in this era as it relates to Israel and the Palestinians. Yeah, Netanyahu can listen. Netanyahu is weak in Israel. He he has a, a brokered government. He's not consolidated. Missed a deadline just a few weeks ago, even weaker than ever before. He's still the longest serving prime minister uh, in Israel's history. But he's a weak leader, and, and because of his weakness, it has made him connect to the more extreme conservative elements of the Israeli political movement because they give him cover. 
-hmm. They say yes to all of this aggression, violence, and killing of Palestinians and Palestinian children and the elderly and, and others. This is a real political nightmare. And if Biden does not figure out that he's leading in this century and not in the 90s, we're gonna have more problems. And he's deflating people's willingness to support him in any reelection. He's hurting Kamala Harris or whoever else wants to run for president one day because yes. she's connected to this. It's 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 a nightmare, and I hope he gets it together. I think that's a really good point about you know remembering that it's not the 90s. Man, he's been in office for so long. He's been in and out of power. Power he like forgets. But yeah, this is not. Look, it is not. It is very clear, especially to Americans and especially to young American Jews, um, that the state of Israel is not representing them, that the state of Israel is also not interested in a two state solution. They're interested in slow, slow, but methodical ethnic cleansing. They are not interested in any kind of peace process. Most experts will tell you the peace process is dead. The peace process is not is a non-starter and and Israeli prime ministers past themselves have have called this situation apartheid. Not in a negative way, in a positive way. Like no no no, we mean to cluster people into, you know, yeah. bantu stand, you know, sort of ghettos. Um and and so the other thing is is like Biden said, and I mean, we've heard him say, "Oh, I'm I am a Zionist. I completely believe in the state of Israel." You know, I mean, you can believe in it, but that I am for this project, right? This project of ever expansion. So I feel like it's yeah, he is completely behind the times. And when it comes to that mandate, Dr. Ritchie, that you talked about, I think this is one of them. And seeing 500 of his staffers say. Look, we got to do better in the year 2021 when you see the amount of human rights abuses coming from one side a a world class, you know, armed to the teeth military thanks to the United States that has been bludgeoning a a defenseless population in large part. Like you got to do better than this. Uh I just want to Finish with something more that they said. Uh, former staffers say they urge US leaders to join our international allies in calling for an end to Israeli violations of international law, or at minimum, stop obstructing efforts to the United Nations to do so and ensure US aid no longer funds to the imprisonment and torture of Palestinian children, theft and demolition of Palestinian homes and property, and annexation of Palestinian land. That is not. Wishy washy. Like that language is very specific. These are staffers who know what they're talking about. They're not just sort of, this is not a blanket statement of like, you know, both sides and like maybe just give a little more, you know, love to the Palestinian side. It's like, no, here are the things you need to do. You need to stop because the US has been running cover for Israel in the United Nations mm -hmm. for decades now. Yeah. And some of these staffers are policy experts, and that's why they were part of the campaign. Uh, so they they are very familiar uh, with the ins and outs of this. And then America, just think about how deep it goes. This is beyond this uh, neutral statement on Twitter from mm -hmm. President Biden. They are actually engaged in back channel diplomatic conversations in order to stop the United Nations from having a coalition of nations talk up against Israel. Now, why is that important? Can the United Nations really do anything? No. No, they, they're not going to send in some occupying military to do something. But what they can do is they can swiftly shift the narrative, the public relations narrative of Israel across the planet. And yeah. that's the reason why America is jumping in. Because America knows if that happens, if the United Nations, they come in and there's a great humanitarian effort, and we're talking about through public sentiment, that says what Israel is doing is wrong, it is evil, and it's creating chaos and murder. America would then be forced to make a decision on a global scale. America isn't lobbying for the UN to not do this for the sake of Israel. They're yeah. doing it for the sake of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to, you know, as the news of, because look, every time. Uh, rockets stop falling on Israel, and there is a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. Um, the, you know the headlines, mainstream news, they stop covering this issue 100%. And yet, yeah. the, the the occupation rolls on. 
the degradation, the annexation of, of land, the settlements uh, continue. And so right now, what is happening is massive arrests of Palestinians, um, sweeping arrests uh, in what many are calling a collective punishment essentially for the last few weeks. So this is from The Intercept. They write at least 74 Palestinians were detained on Monday afternoon, just on Monday in the first hours of what Israel Israel's police is calling Operation Law and Order, which come on. Sounds familiar? How familiar, how many more yeah. parallels do we want here? Palestinian rights groups call the planned arrest of up to 500 protesters on charges ranging from attacks on the police to vandalism to online incitement, a blatant crackdown on dissent. Time to coincide with the dimming of the global spotlight on the conflict. So the world moves on, we can arrest these people with impunity, it's fine. And and just to give you guys a sense of what these arrests are looking like. This is a young boy who is 11 years old in the East Jerusalem town of, let's see, Beit Hanan, I think I wrote it. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get the name to you exactly. But he's 11. He was detained for throwing rocks. And this is his little sister um, demanding that Israeli police release him. So take a look. Yeah, Dr. Rashad, <laughs> just thought. Damn, you can't write to my. I get, I get so damn emotional when I see things like that. Um, you know, we have, yeah. we have forgotten as a nation, and I'm, I'm talking about primarily Americans. We have forgotten that children are children, no matter where they live. That families are families, no matter where they are located. It doesn't matter if you agree with that country or disagree with the country. The people are not the leadership. You may not like the leadership of that country. You may think the leadership is corrupt, but the people are just as decent and good as any other family you will see in your own community. And they're just trying to make it. They're just trying to survive. And when we see things like that, if you're not affected by that, if you're not affected by that, if it doesn't have some level of emotional impact on you, you have become indoctrinated to a reality that is not real. You don't live in the real world. You live in a bubble of your own selfishness. Yes, that I could not have said it better. There is. No way that these images are telling you anything other than this is a child arguing and 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 begging for her brother, her older brother, to be released once again for throwing rocks. He was he's since been released, but he was detained. Maybe this was his first time. Who knows? But this is the kind of thing that happens every day in Palestine and in the occupied territories and inside Israel as well. With the Palestinian community and imagine, I mean, the parallels to what the the black community in the United States goes through. Yep. Where it's young people, and oh yeah, you know, I first was detained by police at 11, and then 15, and then 18, and then I was, you know, all, you know, on and on and on and on. And people, you know, communities of color who are over police talk about the police like an occupation. And then you see an actual occupation, and, you know, I, I do think that. The silver lining of what's been going on is that people are drawing those parallels and mm -hmm. folks in the United States are waking up to the fact that oh yeah, this militarism just looks the same. Um, so the the home the the town is Beit Hanina, it's a neighborhood of East Jerusalem, which by the way is also where Sheikh Jarrah, the community, the neighborhood where Palestinian families are facing displacement. Um, where this entire thing, this sort of more the newest violence kicked up. Mm -hmm. Where that originated, um, they're still undergoing massive IDF uh, occupation surveillance. They're being patrolled in the streets. People are being prevented from entering. Uh, the other day, a young woman was shot by a rubber bullet inside her home, right? And again, like you want to be surprised 
But then I remember in Sacramento, a gentleman who now I can't remember, but the, the number of black Americans shot inside their home by police, right? Yeah. Um, shot inside their behind their own gates, being told that they're not on the right property. Yeah. So you, um, you make a great point. Uh, and, and what happens, and, and this is just through an organic process, it's not intentional. But what happens is we become desensitized. Yeah. We see so much violence, so much death. We see so much repetition of constitutional rights being violated that we almost accept it as normal. And, and then it takes something extreme for, for it to shock our conscience, right, collectively. It took a George Floyd to shock the conscience of white females in America, white <laughs> mothers who said, we're gonna now protest with black mothers because of what we saw. You know yeah. how many George Floyds are in the ground right now because of cops killing them and there was no video? Yeah. That video made a difference, but that video is necessary now because we have been so desensitized that we don't care about the narrative. We don't care about what actually happened unless we see it, then it shocks us. But that's how we have become as a nation. And it's yeah. unfortunate because I'm, I'm afraid that we will start to dismiss real cases that simply have no video footage. Uh, because we're now only looking for cases with video footage. Yeah, Oh, absolutely. Well, I want to just move on to the whether or not the Biden administration is taking the issue of Israel-Palestine seriously. So Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is in the Middle East today uh, trying to support the current ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And trying to, as he explains, build international support for the rebuilding of the war-torn Gaza. Um, the question is, rebuilding it to what? Um, Blinken was scheduled to visit Jerusalem and meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Minister of Defense Benny Gantz, and Foreign Minister Gabby Ashkenazi. Blinken will meet again or Tuesday night in Jerusalem with the opposition leader, uh, Yair Lapid, who still holds the mandate for forming a new government. So that's pretty interesting meeting with the opposition leader and in addition to Netanyahu. Okay, well, what about the Palestinian side? Well, in the afternoon, um, Blinken's motorcade arrived in Ramallah for a meeting with the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas. He will not meet Hamas, which the US and Israel consider a terrorist organization. He will then travel to Egypt, which brokered the ceasefire and Jordan. Now, I heard you, Dr. Richie, laughing a little bit about not meeting with Hamas. And I think for some people that feels like a, well, of course, they no, the US wouldn't meet with Hamas, which has been deemed by the US as a terrorist organization. Hamas also, and nobody wants to talk about this, is the democratically elected government of Gaza. That's right. Like, So call it what you will. But that's who's in power right now. Call you know you can use the terrorism word or not. Um, but you know, and obviously, I assume that there will be talks or representatives, somebody in Egypt, when Anthony Blinken goes to speak with them. But I don't know what your thoughts are. I'm, my feeling around this is, why just stay in Ramallah? You know, Ramallah is you know arguably like sort of the biggest and most developed city in in the West Bank. But I also I'm like. Go to Gaza. Why not go go see how easy it is to get into Gaza, right? Or go to go to a town inside of Israel, like a Palestinian majority town, and see the settler violence there. Or go to a smaller town in the West Bank and see the settler violence there. Go to Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, where mm -hmm. all of this started. You know, like. Ramallah is a little bit of an easy way out, and Mahmoud Abbas, as I think a lot of Palestinians would say, agree, um, is sort of the most um, capitulating and agreeable when it comes to the uh, allowing for the Israeli like ongoing project of settlements, um, and and sort of the also upholding the status quo from the Palestinian side. Yeah, yeah, this is all about plausible deniability. Uh, they don't go there; they don't have to face the reality. Of what they will learn. Now, do they already know it? Of course they know it. They yeah. know it, but they have deniability right now. They can deny they know it. They can deny the nuances that are important to the narrative. Let's talk about terrorism. I've always found it quite laughable how America will classify or not classify those who are actual terrorists. Um, the KKK, still by many, not considered to be a terrorist organization, right? What happened on January 6th, 
That's terrorism to me. That was an act of violence in order to make a political point, right? No, right. those were protesters. They were unruly. It was unfortunate. So they won't call them protesters. You have a bomb being sent by Israel that blew up children. If I'm one of the parents, or one of those children is my sibling, you're a terrorist to me. You are a terrorist to me. And that's how complex the matter gets. Having a US policy that says we are as a blanket policy, no nuance, no exception. We are not going to include a conversation that is required for a solution is such a blind spot. It's almost like a comedy that is that we see the failure about to happen. Yes. You are leaving out an important piece of the puzzle that's required. Absolutely, absolutely. And to that end, I mean, if the whole point of this trip is to try and build international support for humanitarian aid to Gaza, you might yep. want to ask <laughs> Israel on that one. So just for folks to know, um, that this is this is from The Guardian. He uh, Blinken says that. Uh, he called on greater economic opportunities in both occupied West Bank territories and Gaza, which has been under an Israeli blockade since Hamas came to power in a 2007 election. That sentence right there yep. is all you need to know about Gaza. Oh, I'm advocating for greater economic opportunities and a rebuilding of ravaged places like the COVID testing site in Gaza for Palestinians. Um, oh, also, there's a giant blockade that Israel leads preventing <laughs> any goods coming in and out of Gaza all the time. Anywho, I'm just gonna not connect those two right, parts not of that connect sentence. Them. Don't do anything yeah. about it, don't say anything to <laughs> actually change that. Well, let's just move on as if it'll work out. Oh yeah, and and look, a lot is made of the tunnels, right? Tunnels between Gaza and like Egypt and and you know or or Israel. And I understand that yes, potentially rockets, weapons are going through those tunnels, but also baby formula, yeah. aspirin, construction material. Those things are also going through those tunnels for Gazans who are cut off from the outside world. And their only way for goods to get in and out is through Israel. And just to show that Israel does have control of this, on the day that Anthony Blinken arrived in Jerusalem, Israel allowed food and fuel into the coastal strip for the first time since the fighting ended. Amazing. Food and fuel, food and fuel for the first time. So what are we to understand exactly? It's so people have needs like food and fuel, and that those things have not been accessible to Gazans in the last what, like five days now since the ceasefire or more. Um, and that, oh yeah, Israel's like, okay, we, we will allow this. Meanwhile, you ask Israel any other time, you ask the government any other time about why they're allowing a blockade to continue. And they're like, oh, because it's all weapons. It's always weapons. There's nothing but weapons. Well, what about the food and fuel? No, 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 weapons. Mm -hmm. So. Yep, that's the narrative, that's the disguise. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the big difference between uh, Israel and the Palestinians? Israel has a better public relations team, <laughs> okay? J just, just think about that, because so, for, for so long, people have demonized uh, the Palestinians and have glorified the Israelis. You have presidents like Jimmy Carter, former president Jimmy Carter. He knew what was up back then, yeah. and he decided to tell you what was up. Oh, they blasted him. I'm not talking about Republicans, I'm talking about Democrats. They blasted him for his stance in halfway support of uh, Palestinians. Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, he's he was seen as a pariah after that statement. Yeah. I mean, and he wrote an entire book about it. He was, you know, he believes in this so much. Um, look, we're gonna see what happens. Uh, with Anthony Blinken, I think it is a really good start that these 500 staffers have are putting pressure on the Biden administration. Um, look, we can't be talking about this issue like it's the 80s or the 90s. It is right. 2021, and every day people are being, our children are being detained and and shot at and killed. Um, let's move on. Let's go back to the what's going on in the in the U.S. in just. Wow, the most gun-toting state in the West, or somewhere near the West. <laughs> it is about to be even easier to own a gun in Texas, because apparently it was hard before. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott is uh, continuing to push 
to make Texas pretty much the most pro-life, pro-death state in the entire union. Texas lawmakers have passed a bill that would allow residents to carry handguns without a license, background check, or training, sending the legislation to Governor Greg Abbott's desk to sign. And the state Republican, um, the state Republican dominated legislature approved of the measure. And Greg Abbott says he's gonna sign it despite, of course, objections. Mind you, this is the first time that the legislature has met since the El Paso shooting that killed 23 people. So wow, how you anyway? Um, so just a little bit more context about what currently what current laws say in Texas. Current law in Texas requires owners to be licensed to carry a handgun, both concealed and open. Applicants are also required to submit fingerprints, complete four to six hours of training, pass a written exam, and then pass a proficiency, proficiency shooting proficiency test. Does that mean like you have to shoot good to own a gun? <laughs> like, you can you hit this target? I that feels scary. Anyway, all that doesn't matter cuz apparently all of those things are going away. So, you don't need a license to carry a handgun. You you can don't have to submit fingerprints. Um no written exam and definitely not a shooting proficiency exam. Um so prepare for bullets to fly. This is going to this is can only work out great. Um so what was already happening in Texas? Texas already allows rifles to be carried without a public license. Or in public without a license, so this is just applies to handguns. And the measure they sent, would, uh, Greg Abbott would allow anyone age 21 or older to carry a handgun as long as they do not have a felony criminal conviction or some other legal prohibition in their background. Now, see, that's something that I don't understand. So it's like you're not, you don't have any database for any way to track the gun owners, but you are going to prohibit them if they have a felony criminal conviction or some kind of other like prohibition. I'm not even sure how all this is gonna work. Um, of course, the NRA celebrated it. And whenever the NRA celebrates anything, it's scary as hell. Uh, they called it the most significant gun rights measure in the state's history. Um, the measure is opposed, of course, by law enforcement groups who say it would endanger the public and police. Gun control groups also oppose the measure, noting the state's recent history of mass shootings, including those at an El Paso Walmart, a church in Sutherland Springs, and a high school outside of Houston. Um, thoughts, on Dr. Rich? <laughs> yeah, these people crazy as hell. You know, <laughs> they they're so insane that they have made friends of police officers and those that are gun reform advocates or mm -hmm. gun control advocates. So literally. You have the policing community and the gun control community saying the same thing because of how insane the Texas legislation is that yeah. has been presented. And here's what's wild about you know this kind of legislation. They say this is um, a freedom, right? Having a gun is a constitutional right. So anytime you have more freedom, to have more guns or you have the ability to get a gun without some level of bureaucracy involved, that somehow equates to freedom. Let me show you how ridiculous that is. We have a lot of constitutional rights. I have the freedom of assembly, I have the freedom of speech. But all of those freedoms come with restrictions. Yeah. If I yell fire, use my freedom of speech. If I yell fire, there's no fire. People get injured, I can be arrested, right? My freedom of speech has a limitation. Every freedom you have has a limitation. Every right you have has a common sense regulation. No one says these regulations are speech control. Yeah. No one says this is assembly control, right? You, you can't assemble in my front yard, that's my private property. As soon as your right starts to interfere with mine, we have a problem. Right? Yeah. So look at the right to bear arms. That is a right. Technically, bearing arms also meant knives back then, but that's a different argument. You have the right to bear arms. But your I right wish to, it were just knives now. Right, exactly. But your right to bear arms, does it interfere with my right of liberty? Yes, it can. And if it interferes with my right to liberty, we now have a constitutional problem and we must have common sense regulation in order to make sure they can coexist 
as rights in the United States. And that's what Texas is eliminating. They are eliminating the common sense barriers that are involved with your constitutional rights. It's the equivalent of saying your, your freedom of speech is now unlimited. Yeah. You can put hits out on people. You can yell fire in crowded buildings and get people injured. You can incite riots with your speech now because we are eliminating eliminating the barrier of your freedom of speech. That yeah. is the equivalent of what they're doing in Texas. This is, I mean, and this is one thing where I'm like back to Biden and the lack of an executive order. Just, just background checks, increase background checks, eliminate. You know the the ghost guns where people can like 3D print whatever gun they want to do, right? Like like this is where because this Texas state law cannot override federal law, so that is that's super that's important right. to remember. So if you actually want to keep people safe, the Biden administration can do that right now. Um, and talk about an issue that is like, I mean, we've been talking about a lot of supposed hot button issues, you know, uh, qualified immunity, Israel Palestine, gun control. In the year 2021, after this many mass shootings, after like we're you know a month out of quarantine, and you know we've got more mass shootings than we've had in like three years or whatever, like this is not a controversial issue. This is something that he will be applauded for, heralded. He might even win a Nobel Prize. You know, like why not? You know, he's <laughs> Obama adjacent. Like, you know, like this. It's such a no brainer to me. And I'm also like, where is Texas headed? Like. Okay, so all abortions are criminalized. They just passed a law that is saying that you can't learn about racism in 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 classrooms. So cool. So like that eliminates most of American history. And then now this. So it's just like I feel like Greg Abbott has like this death wish. Like he's just like pummeling towards some sort of abyss here. Yeah, yeah. You got to think about how um, how ironic it is that they're passing laws. Just think about the laws to eliminate critical race theory as curriculum. First of all, K through 12 educators don't really teach critical race theory. No. I'm a college <laughs> professor, I teach critical race theory at the university. And I teach critical race theory as a prerequisite so you can understand the context of bias in America. And that could be a business context, a political context, sometimes even a social context. But yeah. it, it encourages you to critically and analytically think about race and racism in the United States. It's basically history in a theoretical framework. Now they are passing laws to make it illegal for certain um, curriculum to be taught. Think about what they have not passed a law for. In these states that say it is now illegal to teach critical race theory, there's no law saying you cannot teach white supremacy is a positive thing. There yeah. is no law that says you cannot teach that the Holocaust was a hoax. You are legally able to teach these ridiculous ideologies in these states. Mm -hmm. But the one thing you cannot teach is critical race theory, the history of racism in a theoretical framework in the United States of America. That right. is now against the law in states around this country. Once again, heart goes out to Texas. I've said this two days in a row now. But Dr. Rashad Ritchie, thank you so much for being here. And you guys don't miss him on Thursday, May 27th. He's gonna be with Anna Kasparian on the conversation. I believe on the other side of that, being interviewed by Anna. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all about, I'm sure, your new show, Indisputable, um, coming to, well, wherever you get TYT. So thank you yep. so much, Dr. Richie. Thank you, been, been real, real fun, I appreciate you. It's been, yeah, fun, enlightening, yeah. all the things. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.